Hello and welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Buy Round interview show. Now today I'm joined by a very special guest, a very interesting man um, who's had quite an amazing career, uh, over 300 NRL games, a premiership to throw in there as well, uh, recently returned from France or Catalonia, Mitchell Pierce. Thanks Jimmy, good to be here. Yeah, great to have you on mate, um, back from France. Yeah, got back uh, two weeks ago. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, come back into Australia. It's obviously home, but I uh, love my time over there, especially the second year. I uh, really started to get settled and enjoyed the freedom of Europe. So I did a bit of travel, but, um, yeah, back in Australia for a little bit before Christmas. What's the go, Mitch? Um, I know you, uh, like, technically announced your retirement. Um, are the boots well and truly hung up? Yeah, I just think for me, um, I had an opportunity to play another year over there. The club were pretty keen at the back end of the year. I felt like I was in a in a good place there. But um, for me, I just going through the whole cycle again and um, pre-season and the whole length of a season, I just felt like I was keen for to hang the boots up and try something new. Um, not sure exactly what that is yet. Got some ideas that I want to do off the field. But um, yeah, it was just the time... I think for for a new challenge. Was there like a a light bulb moment, or the penny drops, or it was just a bit of an assessment? I, your body couldn't go through another twelve months of really intense hard football because the seasons like we were talking about yeah. they are longer. But yeah. like you could argue the games aren't quite as intense. Yeah. You don't get the full preseason, which there's pros and cons to that. Yeah. But you, did you just feel like you, you just couldn't be? you couldn't do that grueling 12 months of football again? I feel I could have, because I've always been someone who loves training. I like routine. I like the discipline. And in France, um, the coach had a good system there where he didn't sort of overcook the older boys. So it wasn't to do with that. It was just, for me, it was more um, probably open to get out of the system of rugby league a bit, try something new, which I think led me to that decision to, to, to retire. And then just, you know, going through the whole season, I love the back end of the year as you get older, you know, the fun part of the year when you got to deliver and the big games come around. But, yeah, just going through it all again, um, you know, I've sort of came to a conclusion. I was, I was proud of what I've done in my career. Um, I started reflecting a bit and then sort of came to, to the answer to retire. Yeah, it's funny, those little reflections yeah. that you have and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's dawn and maybe it's, maybe it's time. Yeah, it's a bit of a weird feeling. Um, I was really emotional going into the grand final, my last game. Um, that week, you know, you start to get a fair, fair few emotions coming up. Uh, excitement for the new challenge. Um, you know, emotions of, yeah, like reflection on all the good times, but I'm not dead. <laughs> life just, yeah, yeah, life yeah. just yeah. starts. So <laughs> I think you've got to remind yourself right. that a bit. Uh, <laughs> When you come to an end and everyone's giving you these nice messages, it's like you're about to go to your funeral. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is, isn't yeah. it? And even like, oh, this is this is the last time I'll I'll go to the gym. It's like, no, it's not. Yeah, yeah. Or oh, the last ever weight session, or the you know the last captain's run. It's like, yeah. f no. It's funny that you say because I was two weeks after the grand final, I was back in France with one of the other boys and we ran a 15k road run. <laughs> And when you finish, everyone says it, oh, you don't have to train. And when it's ingrained in you, I think we'll always have that that drive. Always want to have, you know, train and be healthy and that type of stuff. So, uh, it, yeah, it's one door closes, but I'm, I'm really excited for what's next. Yeah, so I know you, you were quite brief. What ambitions do you have uh, for the future post, uh, post your magnificent football career? I love to stay in footy. Um, you know, it's all I've known. It's my, been my passion since I was a kid. I think as you get older... <clears throat> It's not everything, but I feel like I've got a lot to offer. So I'd, I'd love to do some some coaching stuff, um, you know, maybe in the in the development side of stuff to start with, just with the halves. Um, when I was coming through, I had some really good mentors as halfbacks, um, and I learned a lot off them. They were the guys I'd listened to probably more than a lot of my coaches because it was my position and my passion. So I'd like to pass on a lot of that knowledge. Uh, and I'd also like to help in some mentoring roles with younger kids, um, I've obviously had a few ups and downs in my career and ro ro rid a few roller coasters. So um, I feel – and I, I care, you know, I care about um, helping people as well. So I, I think that kind of space would be um, enjoyable. So 
see what manifests there. Yeah, you know who you should um, speak to, and we had him on the podcast, uh, Todd Carney. Yeah, he's, I talk to Toddy all the time. Yeah, yeah like yeah. W w what a story. Yeah, and you know he had well documented ups and downs, but yeah. um, the, the work that he's doing now on the on the Gold Coast with with some of the schools and just sitting one on one with him, you can just see he's a different person to to the person I I imagined him to be, and again he gets that. That that buzz, that fix is by is by helping people. Toddy's a great mate of mine. We played together at the Roosters, and I actually went to the school with him last year. I came back. He um, I went on stayed up with Toddy and the Goldie for a couple of days, and uh, he took me to the school. Yeah, I'm really proud of Toddy what yeah. he's done, and I saw him on the podcast the other week, and he's had a similar relationship with alcohol that I have over the years, and um, he's quit quit drinking. I've actually quit drinking myself um, about a year ago. It was about the same time as Toddy. So we talk a fair bit about it, um, but yeah, it's um, everyone's on their own journey. But I suppose it's um, how different things affect you. And yeah, I, I stopped drinking about a year ago. Um, just had enough of it. But just completely, just stopped, mate. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I've had a bad relationship with 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 that sort of stuff through my career, or just uh, plenty of good times as well. Mm. Um, I think you get to an age. I was just a bit tired and, and burnt out by the whole thing and you want to grow up don't you and for me I, I struggled to grow up whenever i had a relationship with alcohol um some people can drink all their lives and be social and doesn't change their personality too much uh, i know toddy spoke about the same sort of thing uh, but it's been the best thing for me and when i was playing my footy career um there'd be periods where i wouldn't even drink all season because footy was always my number one you know committing to the game and my teammates was my priority i never sabotaged that Whenever alcohol came in, um, you know, it was always a roller coaster. Mm. So it's time to just live a bit bit cleaner, mate. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I get what you're saying. And um, look, I I always in, enjoy to drink. I guess with age, you yeah. you know, you naturally you pull back. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I have two young kids now and they're more a priority than, you know, who's still up. Yeah. Or yeah. where <laughs> where's still open, you know, because we, you, yeah. you know, and I think especially with young athletes mm. you, and even the one, what you spoke about there about you go no 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 for so long yeah and then all of a sudden you can and that that release it just maybe i don't know it always fascinates me maybe that the the best way to approach it is okay it's it's okay to have you know drink responsibly in the season yeah and then you don't get that that full blown just crash at the end of the season where you think i've got to drink as much beer as i can yep. as much vodka and everything everything that goes with it in a, such a short time yep. frame i'm always fascinated to know wh whether that would be a better approach or not i think it's definitely for me i think it's definitely a personality thing isn't it yeah you know, there's as we know plenty of guys that uh like we said earlier there's i've got mates that can drink go home to their their families and it doesn't really affect them and they've got that really balanced personality i was on I don't know if it's unfortunate or, or, or lucky because it helps you in different ways, but my personality was always really high or uh, really low. So when I'd add alcohol and, and party into that, um, it would affect my mood. And when you're younger, you, you're stubborn. You, you, you come into rugby league and it's such a system. And especially when we started drinking and, um, and enjoying time with the boys and, 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 and all that, that was just as much as important as it was as how you performed on the field. So you sort of get into that system young, it becomes a habit, you enjoy that cycle. Um, and in the early days, I really enjoyed that of working hard all year and then letting your hair down. Mm. But it comes with um, side effects sometimes as well. And um, yeah, like you said, you get to a certain age where um, you finally try and pull your head in. And yeah, for me now, sober, sober life works. Yeah, have you tried uh, medicinal marijuana? I have, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. No, it, it, it seriously is good. Yeah. And it, it is, mate. Yeah. Like, for, for me, I, I'm i quite a frequent user of it. Yep. Um, and I think it helps. For, for me, I use it for, for a lot of pain that, that yep. um, and sleep issues that I have and, and mental health issues. But yeah. for, for me, I, I for any ex-footballer, yeah. like I'd always recommend getting in touch with people, uh, the, the medicinal marijuana people. I started microdosing with the mushrooms about a year ago. Um, there's a lot of science into that. One of yeah. my good mates overseas got, got me into it. 
uh, when I was playing over there. Sort of had a big lifestyle change, uh, stopped drinking and the magic mush, the magic mushrooms. <laughs> Cut that one out. <laughs> They're not magic mushrooms. <laughs> the micro dosing. Um, so Joe Rogan and that speak yeah. a lot about it. It's obviously mm. pretty pretty well known now. But for me, that gave me a lot of clarity. I'm similar mm. to, to yourself. I had I've always struggled with moods and, and that sort of stuff at times. And um, you go through different things to try and balance out a bit. But that's really helped me. Um, the non drinking and and the micro dosing with the, the mm. mushrooms. Um, there's a lot of health benefits, clarity in the mind. Um, yeah, this, it's so good now with all the podcasts yeah. uh, it's and becoming all the less to, it's, coming, it's becoming less taboo, isn't it? It is. Like, yeah. you know, 10 years ago or when you were at the, you know, when, when you were the state of origin half, yeah. if you mentioned that, it would just be like, wow, <laughs> what, what's going on? But yeah. now it's like, well, yeah. no, it's... It was a good it, push in America now, isn't there? Yeah. So it's all coming from that. And then, but yeah, it's the health stuff. I think I was only talking to a good mate uh, since we caught up. Um, since I got back, we've been talking about ice baths and... Mm. Um, it's becoming the, the the cool thing to do now, isn't it? Where, as I spoke about earlier, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, coming into footy, you know, it was drinking and turning up and ripping in. But I think even the younger generation in, in the in rugby league now, which is great, is is more about the holistic side of things. And Well, you um, think about doing breath work. Yeah. Like yeah. when I first started my career, yeah. if, it, if someone came in and said, we're going to do some breathing exercises, you'd be out. like... I think I've got it covered. I've been doing this since the day I was born. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, still alive. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got this one. Don't yeah. worry, I, I can breathe. But now it's yeah. like, oh no, we can, we can look to gain a competitive advantage as yeah. a, as an athlete. You improve, and you know the ice baths have been around for a long time. But um, for me, performance is it, it, fascinating, and what's what you do to get the best out of yourself. Um, is really interesting. And even some of that stuff around, like for me, some of the best responses to a defeat has been around using alcohol. And it's funny, like yeah. the pub session on a, the, we're doing the review in the yeah. pub. I've done that at the Bulldogs before. <laughs> really? And it was like, yeah. we got smashed yeah, yeah. by the Panthers. I think it was 2017. Do a review in the pub on the Monday. Come back out next week. It's like happy days. But yeah. then you can't do that every week. Yeah. But it's funny. You you can use alcohol to bring you together. But then there's other ways as an individual athlete yeah. that you can look to peak your performance. And the 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 way it's going, it's it's fascinating. I always think you know now it'll never get better than now. Yeah, but yeah. I think we've only scratched the surface. Where these athletes are going to be in another ten years? Yeah, it's going to be crazy. fascinating with the, the equipment, the technology. Yeah all these new areas that the individual is diving into and clubs are getting on board. And if, if you're not part of it now, you're, yeah. you're gone. What's your health too, isn't it? Yeah. At the end of the day, I suppose you realise that at our age, um, you want to be healthy into your 40s and 50s. And it's quite sad really when you see all this, the, the brain traumas and, and all that. You don't think about that when you're in your early 20s, just throwing your head into anyone and doing whatever you feel off the field. But light bulb happens when you get into your 30s and you want to be healthy with your children and but, well, have an impact, don't yeah, you, so? You do, man, when, <laughs> when, when, when you're in your 20s, like for me, like you just, you just didn't care. Nah. Like, <laughs> Literally. You just, yeah. I, I, I don't care where I wake up. Yeah. I, I, I'll deal with it. That's tomorrow's problem. <laughs> I'm living, like you live yeah. in the moment. You do, yeah, like, yeah there's not you much just, training. Like whatever's tomorrow, training tomorrow, I, I'll be, I'll win. Yeah. I'll, I'll deal with it that tomorrow. I'll win anything you throw at me. Yeah. And I'm just gonna have a good time. I'm here to have a good time or in the game, in the moment, like, you know, you, you, you playing out on an edge there. Yeah. You have some big back row on that. Yeah. You're not thinking, what? Oh, it was a mental I, game, wasn't it? Like, it was a challenge. I've got, I, I've got yeah. to show, I've got to show him what I'm actually made of. Yeah. Cause if I put my body in front now, yeah. I've got to keep doing it. If I show a sign of weakness, then, I'm screwed. I've screwed up the long game. You wonder sometimes too if that mentality made you a better player or it was detrimental. Because I think now, a lot of the time, like you said, you, you'd enjoy going for a beer and then you'd say, no, nah, I'll make sure on Monday I'm going to be the best at training and then I'll back up next week and use it as fuel. And mm. I do think that sometimes whether the other mindset of a karma existence and not chasing those challenges would make you a better player or a worse player. It's an interesting argument, but... It, um, I think, it, you know, what? <laughs> I think it comes down to the individual. Yeah. Uh, like, personality type. Yeah. From 
my observations, personality type is is key in that. Yeah, definitely. And I don't think it's a cookie cutter approach for like what would work for Mitchell Pierce would work for me or work for any other player in the NRL. Definitely. There's a sort of like there's like you know you pigeonhole some in certain groups, but yeah, I think it's it's got to be a a bespoke yeah. a, approach to, to life, football, and peak performance. Most definitely. definitely. Yeah. Um, just going back to the very beginning. Mitch and and growing up. So when I was a kid, um, we'd get our some of our games recorded yep. on video. We get our ga- the game sent. You know, we're playing like a rep game under elevens. And at the end of these videos, there would be a coaching lesson by none other than Wayne Pierce, oh, well. <laughs> your dad. And I actually spoke to him about this. It was like yeah, I saw a the bit, podcast. It was a bit. <laughs> <laughs> did you, what do you reckon? Great. <laughs> um, Sitting across from him, I was like, geez, like, I used to watch those videos and, like, yeah. they'd be doing all these lessons and stuff, and it was, you know, this Australian idol. And I'm I'm getting it in video, and I'm thinking That's about crazy, it. crazy, isn't it? It yeah. is. <laughs> but you got, you didn't get a video of it. Yeah, he was you, the example. He, he was, he was there in the flesh. Yeah. What, what was that like for you as a, as a kid growing up with, with, with a, with a father, with 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 such a, a famous name, and I, I guess you start rugby league, it, it's only natural. But, but can you tell us about coming through the the junior ranks and, and what it was like having Wayne as your as your father? Well, for me, um, it's normal. You know, I think um, when you're when you, your father's whoever your dad is, it's it's normal to think that that's just the way it yeah. is at that age until you get a little bit older. And obviously, I realised that dad had. A good profile out of rugby league and it was it was a bit of a legend um for me it's not till i've gotten older i've realized how good an example my dad was and even coming back now going into the next phase of my life as a man and learning the next phase of life uh, beyond footy <clears throat> i realized what a good example my dad's been you know his work ethic um his discipline you know he's known for that from the outside but i just used to see that and think that was normal you know the way he trains you know he's up at 6 a.m. every morning he's at the gym he's on his computer like everything he's done is through hard work so I'd like to think the same thing from my career that um, anywhere I've been or anything that I've done is all come from hard work you know you get you get what you give and that's been ingrained in me I never really have to think about that too much so that's from your from your examples isn't it? it's from your leaders so I'm very grateful for my dad with that um, at the same time probably as I got into my junior footy um, and I started to make a name for myself, you know, sort of 15, 16, when clubs start to talk to you. I was really anxious, created a lot of anxiety for me, um, having that name. I was always a bit resentful. Uh, not resentful, it's the wrong word. Uh, rebellious towards it because mm-hmm. I wanted to be my own man. Yeah, you want to you want to separate. Yeah. And like you're- well, It's, your it's insecurity, really. Yeah. It's an insecurity but because- But it's, na- it's a natural way to feel. It's a, it's a young boy- finding your way in the world yeah. and then probably feeling that presence um that presence of of my dad which is was obviously a great example as a leader but he's a strong man he's a leader and he had a big big uh big influence so i probably felt maybe that subconsciously you feel that presence a bit i wanted to sort of find my own way and i was i was a bit insecure in the fact that um i'd always listen to dad but i wanted to do my own thing and i i think a lot of my drinking and that maybe in the way i took the path you know dad was clean skin I can see that now where he was clean skin. He was a role model with that. Obviously had the tendency to enjoy a good time. Our personalities are, are different in some ways, but I probably really rammed home in a few things in rebelling, maybe subconsciously due to all of the pressure. And then it obviously got more uh, magnified the more I came up through the ranks. And uh, I remember when I, I made Australian schoolboys when I was 16, which was, was a big effort at the time, it was the under 18s team. and. I was playing playing really good footy. I knew that I deserved to be there and stuff, but there was always little stories that would pop up as the media do. You know, it was all positive, but I just didn't handle that stuff. I felt a bit of ashamed because I felt like I didn't deserve to be any well, different to my teammates. Well, that's it. At 16, yeah. playing, what, two years above you at the time? Yeah, well, yeah. Like, you're going to get some 18-year-olds there with some pretty, you know, looking at you going well was there no one better in our age group yeah was there no one better in the year below yeah. age group like yeah. is he just here because yeah of, like it's only natural like 
I've always felt I've always had good relationships with my teammates. Yeah. So f- from the boys, I feel like I've always. Well, I guess in a rep team, there was where probably you guys just come, that coming that. together like like the Aussie school boys would. Yeah. There's, there was probably guys. Yeah, probably there's probably jealous people mm. around. But was I never felt it as much from my teammates. I was always always had good connections with my friends and my teammates. But it was more from um, just I was just always a bit paranoid about what other people would think and the media, and it was all my own own head noise but that kind of created some bad habits I think that took it took me into my footy I probably didn't enjoy my early days in my football career even when I was playing rep footy and grand finals when I was young when I look back on it from an older head I wish I enjoyed my time more and took all that uh, Mm. pressure I put on myself more than other people Um, it probably affected my footy as well you know good games you'd feel like on top of the world and then losses you know, it was a lot of kicking yourself and, and overthinking. So now I can see that from a, from an older player. It definitely affected me that the way I approached uh, looking at the situation a bit. Um, but you are what you are at that time. Yeah, you, you know, back then, was there any sort of um, you know, sports psychologist around for you, any sort of professional people um, to help you deal with, with that pressure? of being being part of this this legacy of your of your father even thinking the position that you play like mm. that always comes with a lot of scrutiny in the halves yeah then you've got this famous name in in the game even to the point of the club that you're playing at versus the club that you're not playing at yeah because a lot of pressure around well, why why is the Pierce name mm. you know playing at east was, was yeah. there any sort of professional help available? Yeah, there was always <clears throat> different people you could talk to along the run, but I think Origin brought on another um, amount of pressure as a young half. Uh, you even just 19. 19 or... when I debuted. Uh, debuted first grade at 17. So to come in as a young half, there's pressure anyway. Yeah. I look at the young halves now, I feel sorry for them, some of them, and um, I'd love to get back into that kind of work and, and mentor because as an older head, you can see it from from a mentality point of view. Mm-hmm. There's so much, so much of a different approach you could have. Mm-hmm. Um, well, mate, yeah. the, the young halves. If if you're not winning Origin series or or guiding teams through playoff victories, you're almost written off. Yeah, I like, think about young <laughs> Ilias at at, at, at South, mm-hmm. um, Sexton, who was at the, who was at the Titans, now at the Bulldogs. Like, yeah. you know, people just can't wait, and you forget these are uh, these lads are. Then like 22, 23. Yeah. It takes a while like to develop thing. as a half. Yeah. You know, it really does. Um, so I think that that probably leads into your summer escapes as well as a young half. You know, for me anyway, you, you're trying to enjoy your footy. You know, you're, you're loving living the dream. Um, you, you're making these rep teams. You're achieving some things. But um, there's some dark days there as well, especially as, you know, as a young half, you know. And, you, and you, take, you take the pressure of the team on your shoulders as a half and um, – yeah, it's 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 a great it's a great life and it's yeah <laughs> it's a dream. But yeah, when you ask me about the pressure, there's definitely um, yeah a dark cloud that, that carries mm-hmm. you around during a season as a half or any player. Um, and I, I look at it as an older guy now. Uh, I probably would have if I could have changed a few things around that. The things I would have changed would have been just trying to enjoy your footy a bit more and um, have fun. Have fun. If you're committed and you're focused and you do everything you can. Just have fun and trust the process. Do you reckon that young Mitchell Pierce would listen to someone like yourself, uh, like saying, "Mate, just just enjoy these moments. Don't be don't be too serious when you're on the when you're on the paddock." I would have listened. I, I've always been a good listener. I'd always take the advice, but um, it's hard when you're in that yeah. headspace. It's 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 funny because you we we have this conversation now at 34, but. You're only in the headspace that you're in, mm. you know, maybe at 50 we'll look at this and say, what yeah. the fuck was I saying to James? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, there's no point having regret, but mm. it's, um, it's, in, it's interesting when you look back at different phases of your life mm. and how things affect you and, um, yeah, I do, I do have a lot of sympathy for all the halves that come in though because, mm. yeah, it, you paid well and oh, it's, the, your, the it's your job. And, and you, you, it's yeah. the automatic scapegoat. It's the easy scapegoat. Yeah. Like a team doesn't win, you look to the spine yeah. and not – you look to your seven. And it's your responsibility. You know, you yeah. sign up for that and it's your job and it's it's what you do. It, it is. But, but it the, still doesn't affect oh. sometimes 
um, how players can feel. But the best ones deal with it well and deal with it better than others, and that's why they have longevity as well. Yeah. So, so g- going back to to your debut at the Roosters at seventeen, it was in round two. Yeah, why round two? Do, so do you know much? Of, is that a Brian Smith thing to not put you in at round one and have all the pressure, or or was it just a natural? So Chris Anderson was my coach. Oh, was Chris Anderson so there? So my apologies. Yeah, yeah, so Chris Anderson was the coach. Brian Smith came in a couple of years after. Um, so I trained, I played in Australian schoolboys and then came back and trained with the full-time squad. I was only, I, was, I wasn't even 17 when I started training up with the boys. I might have just turned 17. Um, so it was just, it was all pretty crazy. Ricky Stewart was there the first year when I signed. So I was playing Jersey Flegg. So he kind of was a big influence for me going to the Roosters. Um, when I met with him, being an, an old legend as a halfback, I uh, wanted to learn off him and he had a lot of trust in me. Uh, that was one of the main reasons why I went to the Roosters. And then Chris Anderson got me training in the full-time squad when I came back. Felt like I did a good job in the preseason and just tried to, to rip, in, rip and tear as hard as I could and earn the boys' respect. And um, Jamie Soward was there um, the first year. Um, so I think he played the first game <clears throat> but there was there was all this confusion about the halves. I didn't think I'd debut that early. Um, the boys got flogged, I think, in round one. So it op- opened up an opportunity for me to step up and play in the, in the second game. And yeah, I look back at photos how young I was. I was I was, I was a seventeen year old boy. So yeah, it was um, a school kid, really. I was like yeah. the seventeen year old lads that at that age would be literally putting on their shirt and tie and yeah. backpack on and going to to study, and you're there on TV, yeah. just trying to steer around a bunch of men. Well, that's what it is. It was, you feel like a little boy around men. I remember those first couple of games, you know, Chris Beattie was an old front rower, Danny Nutley, guys that mm. most of the generation now probably wouldn't even remember, yeah. but they were, they were legends. And, you know, telling these guys, you know, Craig Fitzgibbon was in my, in my uh, was the captain, I think at the time, absolute legend, Mark O'Mealy. You know, all these guys as a young half, you feel like a little boy. You feel like the water boy telling them where to run. Um, but yeah, I just embraced it, I suppose. I was proud of myself that year. I think I played about 16 or 17 games. Um, and then uh, that led me into 2008 where we had a really good year and I ended up debuting in Origin. So uh, it all happened very fast. What are you, looking back at Origin, you what, not, you just turned 19? 19, yeah. And I've I've heard you say, like in hindsight, you you probably should have been being delayed. You, yeah. Is that how you still feel? Yeah, I just think for me, and I spoke a bit about enjoying your footy. Um, at nineteen, when I got picked, I was full of beans. Like, yeah, how good's this? You're confident. We're having a really good year that year. Uh, I think the Roosters were at the were at the top of the ladder or right up the top of the ladder. So there's a lot of talk and speculation. I think Brett Kamali, I think, got injured. Something happened with one of the older halves and then I got an opportunity. Um, so in that game itself, I was, it was mad. You know, all, all your mates there, your family, you're running out with all these superstars and how good's this? Um, but losing a couple of those early games, which is difficult for a young half. Like a, I didn't think it was the early games we lost was down to me, as, especially as a half. But the more you lose, it becomes repeat performance and then a bit more pressure adds on top. So probably three years later, two, three years later, it, it, it started to make the Origin Series a bit more uncomfortable, you know, because repeated losses and the state not winning much. That's when it all manifests. It manifests. Yeah. And then you're going into sort of when you should start to learn your trade and it, I felt like I was carrying the weight of pressure on my shoulders and I was, there was, a, I was a split between so proud to be playing for New South Wales and I'd never, ever turn that away and I'd – Always wanted to give 100% and I always feel like I did. But you're going in, there was always that if we lose, <laughs> it's going to be a long, long couple of months. Um, so it took a bit of the enjoyment away. And I feel like if I debuted a little bit later, it might have been a little bit different. I would have been able to learn my trade a bit more, going with a bit more maturity. Um, but that was my path. And like I said, I was so grateful that I got to play young and be a part of those games. Some of the best memories ever. I got to play with some of the best players of all time in some of the best arenas and, and big moments. So, um, yeah, it's um, – Origin for me was a funny time. It was always a, a roller coaster. And when you'd win, it was the greatest feeling ever. When you lose, you, you didn't want to leave the house, to be honest with you. It was yeah. really dark. But 
it's it's life and you just had to get yourself back and get ready for club footy after yeah. it regardless well, well that, that's the beast that origin is mm. and you know we saw in last series was on a knife's edge mm. and you know a, cu a couple of big moments that went the way of queensland yeah. um you know dictated the narrative uh well to, to even now where you know um fitler's gone and in comes michael Maguire. so it, even back when you were playing that you know the magnifying glass was on you we spoke a little earlier about like athlete development peak performance yep. um obviously you're a 19 year old if you got asked are you ready for this you're gonna give the utmost confident answer in saying yes i am because it's what you think you want yeah, and what you think sure. you know is best for you but do you think the people that selected you um perhaps uh, they should have resisted the temptation um <clears throat> i don't think it's that i think maybe at the end of the day if i had a, won a few of those early games and performed to my best when with the team wouldn't be sitting here saying that yeah. as well so it, i was grateful for every opportunity i felt like at the time i was the performing halfback for New South Wales as well. And um, to get picked back to back in series, obviously I had respect from the coaches and my teammates as well. So there was lots of positives, but um, yeah, due to losses at times and um, being young, just from a personal point of view, it, it, it can affect your, uh, I wouldn't say your confidence, but more just, just that, that, that burden and that pressure can accumulate mm -hmm. and it just, um, but yeah, then, just on yeah, just on my journey, it was just different. It was just a different yeah. experience. But, but then I look he, back on it. So, so, but even that, right? Okay, you put a nineteen-year-old halfback in. Yeah, you got two options, and obviously, New South Wales. Uh, everybody in any um, situation like that is going. We're going to win. Yeah. So, we're not going to be. We're not even contemplating losing. So we're not even going to think about what could happen t to Mitchell. Yeah. If we lose. Yeah. We're only thinking about winning. But even if you'd have won, is that the right thing to do to a nineteen-year-old half? Yeah, I, I can't answer that. I, I, I don't know. Um, do you know? What, do you know? I, what I'm like all from my point of view, I'm, I can't. I don't like commenting on that because I'm. I'm grateful. Like, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm grateful for the trust that was put in mm. me as a young half. Um, and as you said, it was what a privilege to play that. So for me, it's hard to answer that. Yeah. 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 It's just, I, I, obviously, an, yeah. an outsider come in. Yeah. I like, love state of origin seen a lot of players get washed up in it and and obviously you know playing against you for a long period of time and going back and looking over you, you, your career just what it what the the upside and and the downside of it yeah. um and just getting caught up in that yeah. at, at 1920 yeah getting picked but like okay we've lost these series yeah. and it's like okay you you know all the ratings in the paper. Yeah, the criticism's like, hard. Yeah, like, it really is. I, I can say that now. I said it all the time, but I can say that now. It was, it was a tough time. Um, it was so enjoyable and a privilege, but at the same time, like the circus around Origin, and I felt personally as well. There was a lot of criticism, a lot of, you know, a lot of hatred. <laughs> there was a lot of hatred in and around those losses, and i totally understand it happens not just for me it happens to any player like you said there's been plenty of players that go in and when you don't deliver and you don't win it's it can be a, it can be a nightmare it could be a beer circus and it makes the theater of origin and it's about winning and going in there and performing and, and if that's you don't you realistically you're never going to change you, you i don't think we can ever change that yeah but you just wonder like you know, and there's so much pressure on selection mm. like what it, what it does to a young individual Definitely, it definitely can have it take its toll and it can affect your club footy at times. You know, you see players coming out of Origin Series, you know, like you said, this year. And um, if they don't seem to perform, say, in a decider, sometimes you can lose them for a few yeah. weeks going back into club footy. Um, yeah, definitely. It's it's like any hyper performance. It's probably the same in, in, in the English Premier League with the soccer, with the football or Super Bowl, uh, with the NFL. All these sports, you know, there's high pressure situations. It brings all the fans in. Everyone loves it. And there's positives of it. And then the negative as a player is if you don't get the job done, you, you got to deal with the repercussions. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's, um, yeah, it's always a crazy time. Mm. You, 
you after a couple of those um decider losses as a young half what do you, I know obviously the, the the pressure cooker again but who who were you go to people to sort of nurture your way out of that um yeah the, after a big loss like that um and it's like that in any game isn't it you lose a grand final or you just feel a lot of shame I think and especially in those for me it's a, you'd always feel shame you feel like you let people down that'd be the worst feeling um and that that's what that's the beauty of footy is when you win you feel like you made everyone proud especially yourself but when you lose you, you, you feel mixed emotions um yeah, losing those deciders was it was a lonely feeling especially if you're losing queensland you know you'd walk off full of a stadium full of hate for you and you just want to hide your hide your head in the locker <laughs> locker and not not move but um um who would i go to i used to talk Throughout my career, my best mate, I used to speak to a lot. You know, your close circle. You obviously like every, like to think everyone. You go to your close circle and friends and family. And uh, but I've always enjoyed, in a weird way, I've always enjoyed trying to bounce back from things. Um, and I'm really proud that I was, however that wherever I created that kind of resilience. I've 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 enjoyed that part of my career, in a weird bit of a sick way. Yeah. Like, whatever bads happen, I've always believe that good comes when you work hard I, I i trust in the in the universe that, that things work for you when you're good or bad when you just dig your heels in and 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 look forward um things things the world gives you back um abundance in in in, in time and um i've enjoyed that challenge through my career i've enjoyed getting criticized and, and proving people wrong i've enjoyed well i haven't enjoyed it but it, if I've had a scandal or something, a mishap, I've enjoyed proving people wrong. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> There's definitely um, a benefit of hardship. And sometimes you can put yourself into like a con controlled situation. Mm. Like, you know, maybe, uh, say for example, like an ice bath is, is a form of, of hardship yep. and yep. stress on your body. But those uncontrollable hardships that, yep. you know, sometimes you can sort of you can you you are responsible for but you you you're not meaning for though for the that particular outcome but it happens yeah, yeah. but it shows what you're made of when you when you come out the other end and absolutely and something like an origin series i can only imagine is that is one of the greatest benefits of hardship yeah well it's just people are going through it in all walks of life yeah, aren't they? You know, way it's... way more extreme examples we're just footballers at and it's just a made up game with made up rules, right? And it's yeah, a made up series exactly. against, you know, a Queensland, two states that I guess are yep. technically made up. Well, I think but, I suppose that mindset of what we were just talking about transfers to everyone though, doesn't yeah. it? You know, we, we use that fuel from our football career and media hype in the scheme of things. When there's, there's, there's people that are dying of cancer and mm. going through unbelievable hardship that are showing way more resilience than what we are. Um, but I suppose from a football point of view, that's that's for me. That's where we use our fuel and our setbacks to to find some resilience. You know, you're always challenging yourself, aren't you? And that's I think that's the biggest thing that, that footy gives you. It gives you um, a platform to expose your personality and um, and test yourself and test how how much grit you got in good times, uh, in bad times, and how humble you can be in good times. Mm. Well, you, you get to show people what you're made of and yeah. like a lot of footballers, um, we're very grateful for, for more opportunities. Um, some would argue, you know, what you deserved or what you deserve or, or, or what not. But um, it's a nice way to segue in because before we get into talking about the, the Roosters Premiership yeah. um, th that you won, always fascinates me that the teams that bounce back, um, you guys went from 09 uh, wooden Spooners yep. to 2010 Grand Final. Um, a lot of teams would love to know and a lot of people would love to know. How do you get such a quick uh, response from a playing group? It's culture, you know. Um, I think 2008, we had a really good year. We were all young kids, a lot of us. Um, the core group that sort of kicked through to the Roosters, sort of 10-year success. Um, a lot of us were young. We had Mitch Orbison was there, Jake Friend. Um, Sean Kenny Dow, Jared Hargraves came, I think the year after, um, Boydie Cordner. So we're all younger guys. In 2009, you know, I know I can put my hand up. 
it was a, it was a loose year. Uh, we had really good success in 2008. Um, the devil came knocking. Probably didn't stay as focused to rugby league the year after, um, and got what we deserved. Made big changes 2010. Everyone was committed. Everyone was was fully focused. Um, and we created that winning winning energy and, and ended up making a grand final. So to answer your question, I think there's no secret. I will, going back on, on, on my career when things have been really good or the team's been really successful, it's when everyone's all in, um, focused, ticking all the boxes and being selfless. So that's it's, – it's, there's no real grey area to that, is there? Um, the years for me personally when I haven't played well, I've gone through patches when I haven't, it's you're doing the alternative. So – um, yeah, that was a great lesson when you look back on that, how yeah. crazy it was to yeah. go from Wooden Spoon to Grand Final. Fascinating, yeah. like absolutely fascinating. And yeah. you just wonder, is it, is, is it simple as that culture switch? And who was the drivers behind that? Was that you know, the, the leaders there or coaching staff? Can, can you recall? I know it was a, yeah. quite a while back. Talking about Toddy earlier. So, so Toddy got the Dally M that year. Uh, me and him played in the halves that year. Me and Toddy didn't have a beer all year that year. I remember... We committed to each other. To, to Is that in the in 2010? That was a 2010 grand final. Um, and a lot of the boys probably learned our lessons from the year before, you know, nine. And, and, and everyone was just really focused, you know, um, really committed to to getting success. And then we had a good year. Um, 13 was a, was a couple of years on. We had two years where Brian Smith was the coach. Um, we we're still going okay, but we weren't probably reaching our potential um but also came down to players as well we recruited really well in 13 Trent Robinson took over changed the whole culture again um it was all professional um brought a whole different perspective on how to play football uh, we really created that long game mentality that a lot of teams play with now built on defense desire effort and all the skill came off the back of it um and 13 we signed James Maloney signed so you bring in the quality of him Sonny Bill Williams Michael Jennings. Yeah. So um, adding those players obviously lifted the whole energy. But what they brought more than anything, especially Sonny, was that their lifestyle, the the presence, the professionalism. So it was another real pecky, um, you know, step up for a lot of us in education on on how what it takes to be successful and, and, and be consistent all the time. And um I suppose that year was sort of the start when Robbo's first year there and they've obviously the success the Roosters have had, you know, a lot of premierships and minor premiers and, and one of the better teams in the competition. Um, that was sort of the probably the start of it. And although I think everyone in that team that year really played their part in sort of creating that. And then obviously the leaders of you've seen what they've done over the last 10 years. They've, they've really run with that and had great success. Yeah. Just quickly going back to your time with Brian Smith, I had a, I was coached by Brian uh, yeah. for England for or he was advising with England. Yep. And I, and I really liked him. Yep. Um but you speak to some people and it, there's not much middle ground with with Brian Smith. I yep. think players I really like him or there's a bit of like oh no he he, he didn't treat me particularly well. How, how was your relationship with with Brian Smith those years? Um it's funny you say I actually ran into Smithy in England this year. We played a game uh, against Lee and uh, Smithy was good mates with Steve Mac McNamara, the coach. So he actually came to the, the the change rooms. I hadn't seen Smithy for a long time. When I was with Smithy as a player, I didn't have the best relationship with him, uh, especially at the back end. Um, Smithy had different approaches to footy, a very, very smart footy brain. Um, Attack-wise, I learned a lot in my first year with Smithy as a half, a lot of eyes up footy and playing what you see. Um, your skill, your catch pass. He's very, very good at, at that sort of stuff. Um, and Smithy's mentality was – was he, he changes a lot of stuff. He used to enjoy mixing up game plans and uh, was very much an attack focused. Um, so, yeah, you learn something off all your coaches. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it was uh, – yeah, the first year especially, Smithy had a big influence on the team, but um, I think – when Robbo came, it was it was a different um, different outlook to footy and a different focus. But there's no doubt that the skills the boys learn off Smithy also carried through the next few years. Yeah. So you, Trent Robinson comes in and you immediately go. You know, you sign a couple of big name players, but then you win the premiership. Yeah. Like you must look back at, at that year, yeah. at that game, and nothing but 
a huge smile. Just makes you – you want that feeling forever, you know. it's um, That was such a special year because I remember losing the 2010 grand final. It sounds weird, but I, after the game I was – we're kind of proud to be there. I wanted to win it. We were young. We kind of had this dream run. Dragons at, at that time were the, the Melbourne Storm. When Wayne Bennett was there, their defence was the best in the comp. They were the team the, – the, the hardest side for probably three years. We were sort of this – fairy tale team where we played all out attack. We were all young kids. Um, so it was a different mentality. And as much as I wanted to win it, I want to win every game, especially a big game. But the feeling was was hurting for a while and then it, it didn't last as long. Maybe because it was, um, there was a bit of grateful to be there, even though we'd earn it, it was, it was a different feeling. In 13, you could feel all year that the expectation with the team we had and the performances that we were doing during the year that we had to win it, like it was there for us. So going into the 13 grand final, I've never been more nervous because I remember being in the sheds. When you've lost one, it's it was always there in the back of your head that they don't come around very often. And yeah, the emotions were, were massive and you could feel the team, you know, we knew going across the board with all the players, we had world-class players in every position and you could just feel, you know, we, we um, yeah, we weren't, we weren't gonna lose that one. and. Came down to the wire. Manly also had just as good a side as us. So it was it was a it was a it was a hard game of footy, and yeah, the relief though after winning was just unbelievable. It's just you look around at all the staff and um, everyone involved, and how how proud everyone is. It's there's nothing better. Quite a couple of days after. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I definitely enjoyed that. It was a good party. I remember, we went back to the Lees Club and ended up in Kings Cross at one of the the clubs there, and. Um, everyone just celebrates you when you win. It's just the rules are different. Yeah. I think when you win a grand final, it's just <laughs> do what you want for a few days. <laughs> if you, <laughs> so it was, yeah, good times. We're going to take a quick break from this podcast to talk to you about AG1. Now, this is a product I've been taking for over a year now, and I absolutely love it. It gives me all of my daily nutritional needs in one easy drink. All you have to do is put in one scoop of AG1 into a nice cold glass of water and you are set for the rest of the day. The cupboard has been cleaned out of tablets and powders because all my needs are met by AG1. The power of routine cannot be underestimated and we all know how small habits lead to big wins. Some of those big wins for me have included better gut health. My clarity, especially in the afternoon, has improved so much gone as the mid-afternoon slump. AG1 is a foundational nutritional supplement. Now, as humans, we all share that same basic foundational needs. That's where AG1 take care of everything. This supports your body's needs like nutrient replenishment, gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. AG1 is the supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. And that's why they've been a partner and I've been a user for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1, a buy round exclusive. If you try AG1, you get a free one year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash buy round. That's drinkag1.com forward slash buy round for our exclusive Australia wide offer. Check it out. The next couple of seasons, the Roosters are, are circling in and around the in and around the top four, yeah. um, and then the rugby league world is it is shocked when Cooper Cronk announces he's coming to Sydney, um, and heavily linked with with the Sydney Roosters. What are your sort of recollections fr fr from that from that time? Yeah, at the time I was a bit shocked. Um, <clears throat> I'd actually had a really good year that year um, in 17. I got back into Origin and I think I got Members Player of the Year or something like that. Um, so I, I wasn't as if I had a really bad mm. season and we, we got knocked out in the major semi though and we'd fallen short in the last two years. So there's a bit of talk around that naturally as a half. Um, and then it was in the holidays that obviously Cooper's stuff got, got announced and... Um, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, look, I look back on it in hindsight. It was a, f a great move from the club. Cooper was uh, an out-and-out -out winner at, in all levels, especially at club level uh, with Storm. Um, I could put my hand up now that 
we fell short in a couple of games and as a half it's your responsibility or a big part of that's your responsibility and I, I you know we won in 13 and we fell short in a couple of other games and the Roosters are a, a club that demands premierships and um, Cooper came available and it, it was it was great for the club to be able to get him at the time I didn't see it like that but I look back it, it was a great move they went ended up going back to back in two premierships um, and I'm and I know talking to all the boys what an influence obviously Cooper brought off the field as well so but at the time for me it was a bit of a shock because um, I'd been at the club my whole career didn't think I was going to leave I still was contracted for another two years so you know you're starting to look to your 30s and and that type of stuff but it's footy um, so I investigated in a couple of other clubs well, hang on. didn't they originally say that um, the Roosters wanted to keep keep you they wanted me to stay, um, but it was going to be a different role. Um, and I felt at that time when I was only 27 that I was a halfback. I'd been a halfback all my career. Obviously, I wasn't going to be playing there if Cooper was there, which I totally understood. Um, but, yeah, it just opened up a door to look to other clubs. And I was flattered because, you, you know, you, you're feeling a bit hurt when that happens. And then there was, you know, a fair few clubs that were, were, were opening the door. So it's, it's only natural as a competitor to – to feel good about that. Um, I was actually close to, I spoke to Melbourne at the time and Cameron Smith was was really good. And that gave me a real kick at the time. Um, he gave me a ring in and around it. Obviously Cooper left and there's a bit of a storyline there mm. that um, Smithy reached out, um, ended up coming down to a few that, that didn't suit the um, the top 30 and the player movement and everything like that with with different things. but. Yeah, I always sometimes kick myself a bit there going how things would have changed maybe if I had gone down there and obviously been able to play with, with him and Billy and those those guys. Um, but uh, Newcastle, the reason I went to Newcastle at the time was I was probably at the time a bit sick of Sydney as well. It was a, you know, it was a big couple of – big 10 years. Um, I'd only ever lived in Sydney. I went and met up with with, with uh, Brownie up there and it was it was a different opportunity. The, the other clubs were more established. They were top four sides, Cronulla and Melbourne, these type of sides. But um, Newcastle were rebuilding and it was a lifestyle change. Um, so, yeah, I jumped at the opportunity and, um, and went to Newey. Yeah. How do you reflect on your, on your time up there? It was um, – I enjoyed – I loved Newey. Um, it was a difficult couple of years. I really enjoyed my footy. The first two years I loved footy up there because the pressure was different to what it was on – the Roosters and what I was used to for 10 years. It was a rebuilding club. A lot of the boys were younger um, and Brownie was all about attack. Kalen was there, Kalen Ponga was there at the time. So we played really good style of footy and it was, yeah, like it was less, it was still pressure to perform obviously, but the pressure was to make the eight, not to, to win the comp. So it was just a different energy for me that I'd been used to. So I really enjoyed that. Um, and yeah, I love Newey. It's a, it's a great town. The, to play footy up there is it, every player should experience it. So you, you know it's probably similar to the north of England in in, in periods. Um, you know everyone's fascinated by rugby league. It's a small town. It's a good rugby league town. So yeah, I love my time up in Newey. Yeah. Um, after Newcastle, you've played your three hundredth NRL game, which is a magnificent achievement. Uh, but you look to go across the world mm. and move to the Catalan Dragons. Can I ask you about what your assessment is of the, the current state of the game over there and, and how you found the Super League in general? Um, yeah, I loved it. I loved my time over there. <coughs> Sorry, mate. When I first um, – when the opportunity came up um, to go to France and never leaving Australia before, it was my best mate I was talking to and he'd lived over in England before, done heaps of travel and he kept pushing me saying, mate, you need to go. It'd be the best thing for your mind, best thing for – everything you know perspective and all that and I was I was pushing it back at the start because you're scared of what you don't know um and then had a bit of a light bulb moment I said look I'm going to get out of here try something new play footy overseas and yeah it was the best thing I, I did I think um from how I am as a person now from the experiences I got over there I don't think I would have uh my mindset would have shifted if I had a stayed in the NRL um so from a lifestyle point of view and and that it was it was unbelievable and the football is enjoyable um it's a tough style of footy as you know super leagues it's we were just talking about it earlier you know people have a perception that it's it's quicker and it's an open style of footy where sometimes the ruck speed over there is reft a little bit different so i, I think you get 
you get away with a lot more time on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Especially Which makes the, your job harder, right? Especially the toughest, the tough, tough sides. You know, your top fours: Wigan, St Helens, or Catalans. Um, the English refs too tend to hate the French as well. So <laughs> I can say that now. I'm retired. Yeah. But there's a bit of a few tough calls Mate, there. <laughs> let me t- do it. There was a French referee yeah. called Thierry Albert. Yeah, he's long since retired. No good. I, <laughs> I support all match officials. I would have loved geez, the French referee that, there in the grand he, final. Oh mate, <laughs> honest to God. But yeah, the style of footy is great, and it it's um I really enjoyed the different stadiums. The, the atmosphere in Eng, in the north of England, I think, is at times better than the NRL atmosphere. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. Well, the stadiums are a lot closer. They're a lot closer. You can you get a feel for. It's madness. Mm. Like I love. They that. let you know a lot of things. Yeah. yeah. How how is your rapport? <laughs> With the with the English fans, did they, did they give you much? They normally hate Aussies, don't they? Yeah, so, it's too loud to hear. But yeah, I probably got a bit of abuse. But um, yeah, you're when you're a foreigner going over there, it's 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 a different beast. But um, yeah, I was I had a heap of English boys playing in my side, and some of them are my close mates now. So um, yeah, but it's it's definitely a different beast, and I love I love the style of footy over there. Like I felt like it was there's less pressure as in media. You know, not every game oh, televised. Yeah. So all that sort of stuff, it was, it was, it's enjoyable. You can sort of not, you can enjoy, you you can relax a bit more after yeah. a win. And after a loss, you're not, you're not like, oh, who's looking at <laughs> you me? You have a like, bad game after a loss, it's not televised. You just tell people yeah. you played well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I've kicked four balls out on the yeah, floor, but I yeah, played well. Yeah, yeah. No Mate, one you, ever talks about it yeah, again. You can, so. you can, it, is a, it is a different beast in that sense, but. I enjoyed, you know, Castleford and, and Wakey, you know, these stadiums you rock up to that it, from an NRL standard as in around here, it's the, the stadiums themselves are a fair way behind, as you know, but I loved it. Like there was at Castleford, we're in these sheds that wouldn't be much bigger than this room mm. and they're shared bathrooms. I didn't know. So I used to go in and do breathing before a game in the cubicle and I was doing a, a shit and I didn't realise it was the opposition. I was getting all these boys knocking on the door. Like that hasn't happened since under fif- under fifteens. But uh, yeah, it's a good laugh. You know, mm. you're pretty much like sardines in the sheds before you run out. But the fans are mad, and everyone is passionate about rugby league. That's what I like. Mm. Mate, there's um, oh, some when you, when you think about like how, and there's still a level to go over here in the NRL, like in terms of like professionalism and, and facility facilities. Yeah, you know, th- there still is a way to go when you compare it to like. NFL, Premier League, but when you go to the Super League, it can be a bit of a yeah. What's going on? An, an eye opener. Yeah. Like I remember actually playing a game in France, yeah. and we the changing rooms. It it wasn't. Like, it must have been like if oh no, we were we were like uh, England under 18s playing France under France under 18s. Yeah. You were in the changing room. It's not like a, and you know, you, you were you one of those people like you get the get the runs a little bit on before game, the game. Before yeah, the game. Yeah. Well, yeah, so was I. There's nowhere to go, <laughs> mate. Hole in the ground. No way. Hole in the ground. So you got your core shorts on, yeah. and you're on game day on these, popping it, and you're like, <laughs> mate, it was it was horrendous. Yeah. Like, what are you supposed to do? But that was just there's normal. That, that was that was the Frenchies for yeah. you. Yeah, it's different, different beast. Just needed a somewhere to sit down it, that that's all i needed but now it's just a <laughs> yeah. step put your stand on there and squat down do your best where was this it was in somewhere somewhere in france, somewhere in france. yeah somewhere yeah. in france but yeah some the of the stadium we had our stadium was actually yeah the, the, was really the Catalan good. stadium's re- really, really good, good stadium. that's, that's one of the that's one of the better ones they're but, doing it up again too um you get a good fan base there i think it's about holds about thirteen thousand. Hmm. but they get a good fan base like the the catalonians are, are very proud rugby league people there, yeah so it's actually quite strange because the majority of it's all rugby union paris wouldn't know much about rugby league but then you just got this this little pocket that just fascinated by rugby league. It's pretty cool. Yeah, their their fans are, are very loud and very passionate. Yeah, Probably are. no more so than their chairman as well. Yeah. How, how did you get on with him? And like, you hear these like crazy stories of him coming into the dressing room. Yeah, are they are they true? Like, did oh, he? Is he yeah. ever like threatened to dock pay? Because you used to back when they <laughs> first come in, you used to hear like people say like, "Oh, the chairman comes in, yeah, and he's not paying us." No pay. 
Uh, to be honest, <laughs> it was really good, but we lost the grand final. So maybe when I go back there, maybe it won't be so good. Now, Bernard was great to me. Um, it's funny, I didn't get too many mad sprays, uh, like involved with the team. We are winning most of the time. Uh, we got one as a, as a group. It was in back end of the first year I was there and we are going through a little rut. We lost about three games and um, yeah, he just, he just hammered everyone in the <laughs> sheds. <Yeah. laughs> Went off. Um, he's just passionate. Yeah. Like, you know, Bernard, you got to understand, he puts all his money in yeah, and he yeah. holds that club together. He's, he's, a, he's a very loyal, uh, good man, you know, he loves mm. rugby league and uh, he's got a really good relationship with the boys. But I suppose just like a coach who's angry after a loss, but the difference with him, he's putting all his hard earned into yeah. it. So. Uh, he, he respects effort, I think. Um, it's just when you, you know, there was a couple of games there when we probably weren't putting the effort in that we, we should have been or we weren't playing at our best and he, he let us know. But there's been some good stories over the years I've heard that he yeah he's torn some boys' heads off. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky you were winning. Yeah. Um, in terms of the standard over there, yeah. where, where do you think it's at compared to the NRL? Obviously, you enjoyed that style of football, but, um, yeah, we... Ha- Obviously, St. Helens beat Penrith Panthers yep. last year. Yep. W- w- where do you think it's at? I think the top, the top teams in Super League, I think, are obviously really a quality. The games aren't too sim- too dissimilar to an NRL game. Um, there's obviously some of the lower sides that you know, are fighting for relegation most years that just probably haven't got the professionalism that the NRL teams consistently have. Uh, but we spoke about it earlier as well. Uh, it's refed a bit different there. So some games you're on the front foot, especially if you've got a big pack, you know, you're on the front foot, you can play a lot of footy. Uh, the defense pressure is probably not as much. There's other games where it's ref different and it's it's slow. It's a bit like old school footy where, you know, it's not, you're not just gonna get around them with 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 sharp plays. So um, I think the NRL is probably more consistently hard week to week. You probably vouch for that. Yeah. Uh, and maybe physically, I think there's some there's so many big boys in the NRL now, mm. you know, especially some of the outside backs and that. I don't know why that. Maybe it's more of the the, the Polynesian influence that that brings that physicality. Yeah. We're over in Super League, it's obviously yeah. more locals, so maybe that's the difference. But yeah, the, you play a lot of footy over there too. You know, you're playing you're playing so much footy, <coughs> so it's a it's a resilient season. You know, you got to be up week after mm. week. There was the first year I played there, it was a Easter weekend, I think it, it oh. was, and we played like five games in, um, it was in like three weeks. Yeah. So like, I remember going into one game and the calves were just gone. Like you, you're on a plane, three days later playing, might have been three or four days later. So that sort of stuff's hard. Um, it's a different hard, isn't it? It's different hard, yeah. And the game, a lot of um, expats struggle the first year when they go over there because the style is different, you know. It's the same probably if English boys come over here, you can yeah. probably vouch for that. It's just a different environment. You put, you know, you're around different people, so it's it's a challenge like anything. Um, but yeah, the style of footy is definitely the top tides are definitely it's, it's, it's a high standard. Yeah. Hey, just to finish on your on your footballing career, you had that that grand final. Um, you shared a, a moment with Sam Tompkins there, obviously. Yeah. A, <clears throat> excuse me, an English legend. How how was that 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 pressure in that in that final moment in that final week for, for the two of you? Yeah, I, I love Sammy. He became a really good mate. Um, he's a legend over in, in England, um, a great leader. Um, and he was great to me. He, he really took me under the wing. He takes a lot of the expats under the wing when we went over there. Uh, it was kind of special because we're kind of both retiring. Uh, I didn't go to plan. I was really disappointed with how it finished. I actually did my hamstring a couple of weeks before in the last game and uh, I redid it in both games. So it was disappointing that I couldn't... <laughs> Uh, play my best footy, um, but yeah, it was uh, it was good to experience our last game together. We had a bit of a moment the night before the game, and some nice things from families and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it was to finish it at, at the stadium there at Old Trafford um, in front of that crowd, and uh, it wasn't meant to be to win it, but um, yeah, to, to get that fairy tale to finish in the grand final, and, and then do it alongside Sammy, who obviously had a He's, he's left a big mark over there in England rugby league. Huge. And, um, he's, he's influenced a lot of people. He's got so much respect within the game over there, and I can see why since playing with him uh, and the person he is. Um, yeah, it was nice to experience all that together. Hey, just quickly on on France. Yeah. You, know, you you go to Perpignan and uh, 
the culture is very different. One of the different things that they have is like their, their food. The language? Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say, don't ask me to say anything. <laughs> did, did you, well, yeah, did you learn any French and how did you go with them, with their delicacies? Oh, the food's good. Um, I did learn a little bit of French. Um, a little bit of French. That sounds bad. I was there for two years. It's difficult because um, I had a couple of the Australian boys with me and then my close friends that I was hanging out with a lot of time were English boys. Yeah. And we had a great relationship with the French boys as well, but you spend most of your time with your, with your closer circle. And a lot of the French boys also, the, the boys over there, a lot of the Frenchies speak, speak English and the coach speaks English. Yeah. So to learn a different language fast, you kind of got to be indulged in it. So yeah, my French is, isn't, isn't that, that good. It's getting better, uh, but the food's amazing. Like Europe, I love the culture of Europe. You're all close to Spain as well. So I spent a lot of time in Barcelona, great city. Um, got to do lots of travel, but I love Europe. It's, it's, you know, there's so many different countries so close. So you're meeting so many different people, you know, footy conversations, not really on the yeah. topic. You get to talk about a lot of other stuff mm. and learn a lot of stuff. And there, yeah, the food's great. People are eating at 10, 10, 30 at night. That's normal. It is, it is weird that isn't it you go to like a you down to that like that main square yeah, yeah. in Perpignan Can they, and yeah, yeah. Can't, can't, wherever yeah. and yeah if you go at like six o'clock for some dinner there's no one there you're like oh this restaurant, this restaurant must be shit there's no one in. <laughs> it's like yeah oh, food's pretty good but the, you get then, the siesta in in the afternoon and then you go for a coffee and then it's not till about 9 30 that you're eating mm. so i've been back in australia and texting my mates to go for a feed and then putting their children to bed and having dinner at 6.30. So what the fuck's going on here? So. <laughs> Man, that's, an, that's, that's another thing that yeah. fucking rattled me in France. Yeah. Like playing, staying in, playing against Catalan. Yeah. Normally, you know, go and get um, something to eat at like mid, mid afternoon, yeah, yeah. go for a walk. Yeah. All the shops are closed. Yeah. Like, well, what well, you get the bakeries. What so you end up having, the bakeries are unreal. Like I've never had so much pastry. But that becomes like a culture, mm. doesn't it? I sort of miss, you know, that's what I love about Europe, you know, that sort of uh, once it takes a bit to get used to it at the start because mm. you're used to your, your bacon and eggs and mm. all the rest of it that you have back Do here. You, you know, it's <coughs> like the frog's legs, snails, the rare beef, tartare, tartare, tartare what tartare, Well, the beef whatever. in, well, Bernard's business is obviously beef. He's, he's, is it? Yeah, that's his, that's his business. That's, um, what do you call it? I've just lost it. The abattoirs. Oh, so that's, yeah. That's Bernard's business. So he, he, Gives a lot of the the meat to all of France, so that's that's where he's created his, his wealth. Um, so the the meat in France is beautiful, a lot of big re big steak restaurants and they just don't cook it for very long. Steak. Yeah, exactly, raw. Mm -hmm. But no, nah, the food's good. Um, love Europe and had a great great time. And summer's unreal. It's beach training and then the beach. That's about all you do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's um, <laughs> I like going there for a, for a little visit. Some of the the cuisine, like I. I I'll, I'll do it, but the the delicacies I just can't can't you do. Don't like not, them. not the frog's yeah. legs and the snails. It's yeah. like the snails are all right. You need to put a bit of uh, garlic, but a bit of flavouring on it. Yeah, the plain ones, it's like it's come straight out of your nose. But oh, <laughs> you yeah. get a bit of garlic and a bit of pepper or something on it. I, I didn't mind them to be honest. It wasn't mm. too bad. Yeah, well, no, thank you for me, um, mate. If, if it's okay, yeah. Um, We'll talk about some of the the scandals. Well, <laughs> I mean, well, what I was going to start with is say, do you find it frustrating how some people are sort of celebrated for being loose and fun and alcohol and you got um, criticised? Do you, know what I'm trying, do you know what I'm trying to say there? Like, yeah, I, yeah. you know, there's there's plenty of people within rugby league that they play that that looser style person, and it's and it's celebrated. And for you, it was front page, back page, every page, pull out the lot. Yeah, it's just um, I don't know how to answer that because um, I'm not sure why sometimes my stuff got. Got highlighted more. Look, I, I, firstly, I take full responsibility for everything I've done wrong. Um, you know, there was things that <clears throat> maybe at times I can, I think, got blown out of proportion. Just a bit. <laughs> we'll get on to that in a but minute. At the but at the same yeah. time, you know, I, I still put myself in, in situations to, to create negativity. So 
I can't shy away from from that. Uh, but to answer your question, it is funny like that in life. You know, some people, you know, sometimes things stick and they 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 get onto you, and then it, everything becomes a uh, a headline, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And then um, some people um, have a different energy about them. I'm not sure. I'm not here to judge it or compare to anything else. Mm. From my perspective, um, you know, there's some scandals or some things that I've done that I'm that I regret and that you know, in, in my private life, that I I, I would have done probably again uh, differently like if I had my time again. Um, and a lot of them came in and around alcohol and, and that type of stuff. Um, but yeah, I think it's one of those things too when you come in young, you, you maybe get a bit of a perception of 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 how you are or you know you have a a hiccup and then it it's uh yeah for me it sort of snowballed a bit at times because yeah. well it, even within certain rugby league people that are sort of celebrated but it, it's a bit of a society thing as well yeah so you know rock stars mm. will talk about doing drugs and being loose yeah. and getting up to all sorts and they're celebrated yeah but then and they're <laughs> They're role models. Mm. People buy their music, listen to their influence children. Yeah. But then a footballer does it. Oh, God, no. But then even, to, I, you know the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah. People are like, oh, Cracker. how good's that? Cracker, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he robbed all these people. Yeah. He he, he, he robbed yeah, yeah, yeah. regular working class people. Yeah, yeah. Took a load of drugs. Yeah. And said, oh, it's, it's funny that it's great, that movie. Yeah, yeah. I'll pay my money. Yeah. To hear a story about someone that robbed everyday working people, yeah. took a load of drugs, and then, oh, that's that's funny. I'm going to laugh at that. Yeah. And then, hang on, a footballer makes a mistake. Oh, God, I tell you what, I don't want to see him on a field again. Yeah. You know, oh, little Johnny or Jane. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. It, like, yeah. it drives me in, in the double standards and especially how... It's funny when you put it like that because, you know... <clears throat> it's true. You, you watch music. I went to Dave Grohl the other night, and you hear about all the musos, and we are we're fascinated by different mm. things, aren't we? But I don't know why if the media in Australia. <clears throat> um, Maybe it's an athlete thing. I don't know. Yeah, like I said before, you know, you take responsibility. If you're doing yeah. the wrong thing by your club, by drinking, or being irresponsible. It's it's you put your hand up and, and and own that you shouldn't have been in that position. It's not a, it's not good leadership. It's not a, it's not being a good example. Um, you know, there's probably times when <clears throat> there was a few things that I did that were innocent. Look, at the time, um, I was never out to hurt anyone. Yeah. But uh, I put myself in the wrong position and I was acting irresponsible and childish. So, um, you know, you, you you don't you don't hope to wake up and and see something that affects your family and, and, and brings shame to you. But, um, yeah, unfortunately I had a few of them and I didn't learn my mm. lesson after the first one. <laughs> um, so like I said before, you know, I'd go through periods to when I was playing and I had a perception of being a party boy and there's no doubt I, I was at the right time. But um, I wouldn't drink for periods of a season and, yeah. and I always put footy first. I think that's why anyone I've ever played with or clubs I've been at with teammates know that I always gave 100% yeah. and I always worked my backside off. So, Because if you weren't, you'd lose the trust of your teammates. Well, you wouldn't be, at, why... wouldn't be at the club. Yeah. Um, and that's what I mean. It wasn't always out of control, drinking all the mm. time. It was when I drink, I know that I couldn't handle it. I spoke about that earlier to you and it's affected – there's no doubt I feel like I would have been a better player if I probably stopped drinking earlier. I would have been more consistent and my moods would have been more balanced, um, I suppose. But And I would have, wouldn't have had the dramas. <laughs> but at the same time, um, yeah, I put myself in those positions mm. and you got to deal with the repercussion. Yeah, so the the one incident that I, I, I guess I was here for that really I think took everyone by surprise in terms of, the severity of punishment was the the Australia Day. I think mm. it was sixteen or or, or seventeen. Yep. You, probably just want to ask, what was it like when you woke up the next day? The worst, honestly. That like, was uh, that was a dark time yeah. because um, I didn't think I was going to play again because there was talk of me um, getting sacked for a year. 
I had the RSPCA. Like I don't. But there was. I'm. Um, uh, no. Nah, nah. But mate, there was. Yeah. There was uh, yeah. women's right. Like there was so many things from my behaviour that I did and the the action that I did that affected. It was it was huge news at the time. But so the next morning you wake up, are you just like, oh, that was a big day. So the next morning I woke up. As you do after a big night, I messaged a couple of the boys and said, you know, you, you got a bit of that alcohol paranoia. And yeah, yeah. Good night, boys. And <laughs> hoping everything was good. Obviously remembered everything that happened. And yeah, look, my behavior was poor. I was, I was way too intoxicated. I'd had a big day of drinking. Um, it was for Australia Day. Uh, I was co-captain at the time. I should have gone home. Um, I ended up back at, at this house that where it all occurred. And I was... Just I was being loose. I was loose. Um, it was it was from a playful place, but obviously when you when you filmed and um, you see yourself in those times, you, you come across obnoxious, arrogant, disrespectful, and that, and I was all of those things. Um, and I'm, I'm very ashamed of that day. It was it was very embarrassing for 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 me, but my family and obviously as a leader at the club, it was it was poor leadership. It was. It was, a, it was a low point in my life. Um, I went to rehab after that. So that kind of blew my, blew, my, blew my mind a bit when I got told I was going to go to the rehab. Um, at that time, it wasn't really that public. A few players had been going, but I suppose it, it happens a lot now, but it wasn't really something that everyone was going to all the time. So for me, that was a bit, whoa, rehab. But I went over to Thailand and you talk about different moments in your life where there are experiences and in hindsight, you appreciate them, um, and it led me to to Thailand. Going over to rehab there, um, I didn't think that I needed to be in rehab as such. When I got told, it's all a bit. You know, I just have a beer every now and then, and this and that. But I learned a lot about myself there. Hung around some awesome people, um, people from all around the world, uh, people struggling with their, all their own different things. And it's probably the first time I'd been in that environment and been able to talk real and emotions and, and all this sort of stuff with, with different people. So as disappointing as that was and how much shame it was, it got me to go to an, an experience that I still tell people about now. Yeah. I, I guess, you know, for, for me in any time, I've had my indiscretions, like I guess, on the field. It's, I think, I, I was felt like I can deal with this, yeah, yeah. but it's not. A, it's not about me. Yeah, it's about like the ripple on effect it has to the people that you know love you the most, yeah, yeah. who talk about you like the sun shines out your ass, <laughs> even though you're only human. Like you know, you, you, yeah. your parents, like yeah, yeah. You're golden child, like yeah, yeah. oh, like you know, yeah, talk yeah. like yeah. for a lot, like for. for I think like about my mom or, or my nan, like yeah. for them, yeah. it'll probably the overwhelming majority of what they'd like brag to their social group around, and then you you're in the, then you're in the shit, and then it's like the hard oh. thing with the dog one. I actually watched the video on the TV that night. I was on a current affair with my mum, so moments <sighs> like that, it was that was that was hard, you know. Like, and mum came over with me. I told her not to, but she was. Being a great mum, mm. I'm coming to Thailand. The first day, she flew all the way there to fly back just so I didn't go over on my own. Like, that's the kind of lady she is. Um, but that was, yeah, that was um, <clears throat> watching them with your mum. Like you said, you can deal with things yourself and you got shame and you know you put yourself in positions that you shouldn't have, but it's when it affects your family. And unfortunately in my career or my life, I've, I've on several occasions I've, I've, I've brought them involved which was never my intention. Anyone who knows me, that's not my intention, but I, um, from selfish acts, I, I brought other people involved. And that's probably the stuff when you get older and more mature that you feel more guilt about. You can deal with stuff yourself, different, different things that you've done or choices you make, because in time things heal and um, you can forgive yourself. But yeah, it's, it's the stuff when you get a bit older, you look back and you, you, you're apologetic about you know the the stuff that you affected the ones that love you because it's not nice for them. No, it's not. It it it, it isn't. And I guess, <coughs> excuse me. In in defence of you, it was a it was a playful manner. Yeah. And even when you think, again, this 
for anyone listening, this isn't to like excuse behavior, mm. but think about the job description that, so part of your job description is to stand in front of 120, 130 kilo men and stop them advancing. Mm. Like that takes a certain type of person yep. with a certain type of mindset. Mm. Um, very extreme. Like, and not all people are like that. So th there are mm. some examples of people in that position that don't, you know, have these extreme lifestyles yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, yeah. or go to excess. And yeah. th they, they are people of extreme. And I've seen many of those people on, on both scales of that. But I think it's, you're naive if you don't think that some of those people that take on that role yeah. are people of high extremes and that some of that extreme is like pushing yourself w with things like with alcohol and, and, and social drugs and, and, and everything else. Yeah. But then it, it almost came as like a bit of a shock. But f for what, for me, for what that particular incident, I remember it being reported and it's like, I think the description was an unspeakable act. Yeah. I'm going like, Oh God, mm. what the fucking hell is going on here? It's like, yeah. that's not unspeakable. Yeah. I can, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mate, it was, um... yeah, it was an embarrassing time. Yeah, of course, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm not. I still get the old yeah. uh, dog emoji sent to me on Instagram <laughs> probably once every month. So I don't think I'll ever live it there. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> Mate, did, yeah. Go, sorry, go on. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, you just, as well as like we spoke about earlier, you know, you go through different phases in your life and if you had a different mindset, mm -hmm. you would have approached it different. As you said before, when you got that extreme personality with footy, um, sometimes you challenge yourself in other ways. Sometimes, not saying that mm -hmm. is something you want to do, but yeah, you challenge it, yourself and it's finding that balance. And I put myself, a lot of the times too, when you'd go to that, um, if you're in that maybe frame of mind where you're being a bit manic or a lot of it was maybe dealing with your football pressure. Yeah. Looking it's for an elite. escape. It's, yeah, yeah. Escape, looking for an elite, escape. Yeah. I don't know, for me, a lot of it was. And it's not excusing the actions. It's but wrong. It's, yeah. it's wrong. And then from a mindset now, from clarity and, and being older, you see it now I wouldn't do that because my my, my presence, uh, my, my energy is a lot calmer. Mm. But... At that time, you're not wired thinking up that consciously. <laughs> you're, you're completely wired up differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think the punishment was too harsh? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, but I'm not a bitter person. Mm. I don't it, – I, I, honestly, I'm not like that. I don't sit there and kick myself and think mm. I'm hardly done by and yeah. compare myself to other people. I, I, it's not who I am. I don't ever want to be like that. Um, it was pretty harsh, but I wasn't in a position to argue at the time. Yeah. So – Look, um, yeah, it's as time goes by, I always get people say, oh, it was a big fine, this and that. I did the wrong thing. Mm. I'm lucky I still got to keep playing. Some people have had hiccups and they haven't been able to play or they get sacked or I had trust from the club just to come back and then I ended up kicking on for a fair few more years playing in the NRL. So it's all, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> was that a big part of the, of coping with it is is owning it, like yeah. taking responsibility for it. I've always tried to do that and I don't do it for any reason, but it's because it's what I want to do. I think I was raised like that, as I spoke about just before. I don't think pointing fingers or blaming people for your own mistakes or bad things that happen in your life is, is the way to be. I never want to be like that. It's not who I am. Um, so I've always tried to take responsibility. It's no different to, to a football game or choices you make. It's, it's your choice. You, you got to, your own man and, um, yeah, anything that happens, I, I, I'd always put my hand up from an authentic point of view and try and be better. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's a, a good way of, uh, of summing it up. And just, I think it speaks volumes to, to the type of person you are. Cause like I'm pushing a little bit and like, yeah. it's, it, it's clear that you're not going to be cast yourself as a, as a victim of unfair treatment or whatever it may be yeah you know you, you i think the overwhelming majority of people would say that the punishment in terms of the number of games was excessive um but it's clear that you you've taken responsibility for that and and also that i guess that little bit of realization that fuck i've done the wrong thing and it's affected 
you know, the ones that you love the most, which is yeah, it's, it's, a, no it's the shitty that. part, isn't it? It is. It definitely yeah. is. But it comes with footy, I suppose. That, yeah, it does. That uh, it's what you sign up for, and <coughs> it's, it's, it's what you sign up for, but it's not what they sign up. For. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, like definitely. They they yeah. they don't yeah. see it as like oh yeah. James is playing yeah. professional sports. Yeah. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Got to explain this headline to the people yeah. you normally brag about. But anyway, um, mate, we do four questions for each and every guest. The yep. first one is the, the dream spine. Yep. Um, so there's no real rules around this. Um, people you've admired, played with, against, whatever it may be. So uh, you won six, seven, nine. Yeah, I'd go <coughs> fullback would be Billy Slater. Uh, five eight, I would go Lockyer. Number seven, I'd go Andrew Johns. I was gonna say, mate, a lot of fucking Queenslanders here. I know, I need even now. I'd, I'd have to. Thurston would be close there, obviously, <clears throat> but Joey was my favourite player. Modelled a lot of my game on Joey, so I can't go past Joey. He's one of the. He's the best I've seen. And the nine, Cameron Smith. Pretty yeah, good nice. team, that. Not bad at all. Not a bad spine at all. Slater, Lockyer, Johns, and. Cameron Smith. Well, um, next question. This is a, one I'd be really interested to know the answer to. If football didn't exist, mm. uh, what do you think you'd be doing? It's a good question now as I'm going into the <coughs> next phase of my life because I've got to start thinking more. But um, I really don't know because through school, I wasn't really a good student as such. Um, I put my mind to something I like to, to learn, but I wouldn't say I was a good student. Um, and footy was just all I focused on, so I, I don't know. Yeah, do you have <laughs> so like literally no backup plan? No, nah. you were all in on football Didn't from have a very young age. I sort of, yeah, I just always had footy, and then didn't really do any study. I did a paper run and stuff when we were younger, <laughs> um, so I might be a paper run boy. Mm, or trying to <laughs> might be doing paper runs yeah, around just like hands yeah. out parade now. I don't know. Um, mate, yeah, I'd, it's a difficult one. I don't know. I, uh, I always got this fantasy to be an mate, artist, way, but, oh. to be an artist or a tattooist because I, I love yeah. I love artwork. I love I love tattoos. I love I just love the mindset and the lifestyle of a tattooist. Are you Are you any good at drawing? I used to try and draw a little bit when I was younger. Like I enjoyed it, and I always love art and. Um, but I've never really tapped right into it. But um, I just love, I love the out, the outcast of of tattooists and that world mm. and art. Sort of fascinates me a bit. I don't know why. Maybe <laughs> maybe you could bring like a bit of the the French culture here and start doing like portrait. Yeah. Who's the Draw. famous French? Who's he? Da Vinci? Is he? No, no. Who's the? Ah. <laughs> cut his ear off. Van Gogh. Van Gogh. He's yeah. French, wasn't he? I think he was. Dutch. What was he? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Let's cut that one out. There. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Wherever he, he was European. <laughs> How about that? But yeah, he's European. European. Met, met, you know how in, in Perpignan, did they have those sketches where you could draw like, get like a caricature of uh, you? Like on the side of the road? Yeah, yeah, they do. Like Barcelona, little... I've got them everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you could bring a bit of that here yeah, and get, that. get yourself up at Bondi. Draw, Sit on draw. Sit bridge. Yeah, 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 just draw, like yeah. charge them like $50 for a sketch. A good, good idea. There you go, lad. Give me time. Life after football. <laughs> Drawing. Hey, would, would you do any um, any media stuff? Um, is like is that a, something you're looking to go to? Yeah, I think staying involved, uh, yeah. maybe a bit of radio. Um, you know, I, I feel like you know, I, I love watching footy and analysing the game. So staying involved with 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 within that, if something of an opportunity maybe comes up, um, and then a bit of the coaching stuff would be obviously be great as well. Um, I, I'd love to do some stuff with with kids as well, though, and not just in footy, but with within schools and mm. some mentoring stuff. Um, quite a deep character i like connecting with people and, and 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 digging down a bit and from experiences i've done myself um so yeah however that manifests i've got some visions to do that um yeah like i said i'm not sure where the where it's going to end up but i really enjoy um working with with different different types of kids and um giving them some direction yeah i, I know we spoke about the at the top of the show but i think i think that'd be so beneficial to, to so many yeah. and i think kids listen to people like yourself because yeah. you're not you're not talking from a textbook yep. you know what i mean like yeah, yeah, yeah. well that's what i it, 
I like to relate at that level, especially if I was, I know when I was younger and <clears throat> textbooks, sort of stuff never, you don't relate to that. Mm. When I was younger, especially when you, you're looking at your idols or different things, you want to know what the dark side is. You want to know what they're struggling with. You know, you want to, you want to connect with that. And I think there's a big, big uh, culture shift now. There's a lot of people talking about this stuff, obviously, and, and being vulnerable. But um, yeah, I'd love to work in with schools and, and, and even within footy, but, um, you know, pass on some stuff, good and bad that I've learned and different mindset things that I might have changed. Cause I think, <clears throat> you know, you get older and you get a bit more an uh, analytical. What's the word? Analytical. And, uh, that's the one. I might need to work that word out. But you get a bit more, um, you know, clear with where you've sort of stuffed mm. up or where you might have changed things. And it's your duty, isn't it, to be of service and pass that on to the next generation? You know what, mate? You used the word there, vulnerability. Like people being vulnerable now. I, don't, yeah. I think back when we – that like time of us coming through, I'm a yeah. little bit older, but – You'd never show any weakness. No, never. <laughs> like, yeah, mm -mm. yeah. If you do, you you get laughed out of the changing room. Yeah, and I still believe in <clears throat> that mentality, the older mentality to an extent. If it's older, I suppose I still think there's a there's not a place to be rugby league's not a place to be soft and mm. and that all the time. <clears throat> still, both styles can work. I think. But there's no doubt, you know, people need to feel comfortable. And I know times in my life when I've felt most secure in an environment, it's when you have trust yeah. and you're able to talk how you feel and express yourself. Mm. Um, it's just making an environment where people can feel like that, I suppose. And, and I think as well, like, it's important to know this, just picking up on something you said about this, pa passing on your knowledge from experience. Like, it's not all been bad. Yeah. There's been <laughs> yeah. fucking shitloads of unbelievable supernova moments that like you can be so proud of and yeah. talk about the like what went into that because they don't happen by accident they're yeah. not fluke yeah like yeah well footy takes as you know more than anyone you know you played up your 400 games to be consistent in this game it takes discipline yeah obsession yeah yeah you know you got to love the game and you got to deal with all the stuff that comes with it, don't you? As, as you could speak, speak more than any of us playing over 400 games. But, you know, I know looking back on my career to, to play a lot of footy consistently, <clears throat> it takes so much effort. And um, it's just funny when you, when you first just retire, you respect straight away for the boys watching doing preseason goes up straight oh, away. Oh, God. I've literally watched and I'm not envious of it because I'm happy I'm retired but I respect it so much because of the effort it takes to do that. And it's funny, it was, I only thought about it a couple of days ago. I was sitting there in bed and I, I felt lazy. You know, I've just finished, I'm taking it easy. And I was just like, it takes so much effort to get up for every, every training session, every game, every year. Like it's, it's a tough sport. And um, I think people do give rugby league players and sportsmen, uh, sports people a lot of credit, but maybe not as much credit as they deserve. Cause some of the boys, they put their body through so much. So just what it takes to yeah. get in the building yeah. is is incredible. Like the amount of competition you face, yeah. like as a sort of probably from about fifteen, yeah. like all competing for that for that spot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then you get in there, and then what it takes to to start, you know, getting up that pecking order, and then once you're there to stay there, it's it's insane. Yeah. Like you know, people sometimes joke, oh, we make a comeback. It's like. Yeah. I, I, I'm so far removed from that. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's funny how when you when you finish, your mindset changes straight away, yeah. doesn't it? But uh, it is. It's such a tough sport, and it's all the other stuff around it, isn't it? You know, you're around big energy all the time. Mm. It's 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 hard. It's 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 a tough sport. It, it, <laughs> you know what it is, but like you 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 just love it. Yeah, it's and you know what? It, in a funny way, and I reckon you'll probably find this, even though you know it's harder life was almost easier then because everything is mapped out for you. Yeah, like right. Like all, uh, you know, you, you know, like if if, you, if we were still playing, we'd know what this year would look like in terms of like the we're doing our preseason now. Yep. Then we're going to have a break. Then we're going to come back. Then it's going to be um, All-Stars weekend trials, round one, know when our buys are, yeah. Know the end, know when your rep period is. Yeah. So you like got that, you got that structure. You, you got that, you got that structure. Even yeah. though it's like so grueling and so demanding, yeah. 
it does all I, it, it is probably easier than like yeah not really knowing you kind of have to like manage yourself a yeah, little right. bit unless you go into a structured role yeah, yeah. but yeah. i think you find you kind of you have to I suppose manage. you're not speaking to ex-players uh that have retired obviously before as well just that high that you get from a from a win and a loss just that build up to something to get a mm. challenge at the end of the week is probably the biggest thing that yeah players have spoke to me that you miss i don't know if it's yeah. for you you know that probably we're probably caring about something as much as the result yeah right like you know do this podcast i care how it goes yeah but you know i'm not coming out of this and being like Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. yeah like reviewing it reviewing every sentence i say where you yeah. think when you play just everything re rev you'd review every tackle yeah every every receive every yeah. kick what could i have done better like well it just it consumes your mind doesn't yeah it? you know and even when you're on your day off you're thinking mm. about kicking the corners on mm. their winger drops back early and you just yeah. you never you never that's actually been interesting when you talk about the how much is going on in your mind when you actually take that game plan and, and obsession out of your mind for me i've noticed you've got so much space <laughs> that i didn't realize i was using up so well, it's very be, interesting i think you become more present yeah because you're not as sidetracked by the the game and and all the games within the game and all yeah. the scrutiny the pressure and, my, and even when it, yeah. it like i think that's great but then i think you do need to fill it and even even things that we we're talking about there about you know the amount of the amount of feedback you get when you're playing yeah you know you review every play but even when you think to training mm. every kick oh that was good yeah. oh here's what you should do constant every, validation e and, yeah. every every pass oh yeah. good back good ball yeah ah, i just need it a bit more in front yeah, yeah. oh great Start oh, analyzing just get, how you yeah. drive your car right yeah, now. yeah. <laughs> well, oh mate you know when that third man in yeah. if you get the heel of the leg yeah. and pull you'll Oh right, okay, thanks, coach. Yeah. You, everything yeah. is it's feedback city, and then nice calmness when you finish. Hey? Yeah, and then whatever <laughs> job you're in, you'll never get that level of feedback. No, definitely, it's fucking insane. Like how, but again, that's what you need to be. Yeah, you, and you, you feel like for me anyway. I felt like you'd fall behind, or you've always got that fear of failure, don't you? So mm. you feel like you're not obsessing, or you. You know, you're not doing that extra kick. It's the same with everyone. You know, you think you're not going to win on the weekend. So, mm. yeah, it's a it's a it's a tough sport, but it's, uh, it's a good life. Mm. So, in answer to the question, what would you be doing if football didn't exist? You've fucking no idea. No idea. Some sort of artist, tattooist. <laughs> like if I could be an artist, yeah. and we have a chat in five years, I'm an yeah. artist. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be surprised, but. Yeah, yeah mate, that's all that. I can come up with. Yeah, that's fair I don't enough. think I'll ever be an artist, and that's the only thing I can yeah. come up with you. So basically, I've got no idea. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, a sliding doors moment. You think about the alternative, um, or had the alternative happening, yeah. or happened? Sorry, rather. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of different sliding doors through your career. Um, I'd, I'd say going over to Europe because of getting out of the NRL system. I feel like if I had have stayed here and just been in Australia around the same stuff I've been programmed with, I wouldn't have changed a bit. I feel over the last year I've I've really made some different changes. It's maturity and grow, growing as well. But I think Europe opened me up to a whole different way of living and coming back to Australia <clears throat> the last couple of weeks to see some family, um, you know, I've noticed a few different things that I perceive things different. So I think that was definitely a sliding doors moment. It's funny that because I'm a, I'm a little bit, same when I go back. Yeah, what do you? Like I perceive things a little bit differently. In just little cultural things, yeah. and it's yeah. it, it's good. Uh, it's it's a good way yeah, to be yeah, like yeah. oh, just well when you live in a different culture or a different country, it certainly yeah. changes who you are. Yeah. In a positive too for me. You yeah, know? like you it, see things just from something that you wouldn't see when you're in that environment. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's good for everyone. I know when I have kids and. I'd be pushing them out to, to travel as much as they can. Yeah. It's good. It's good. It's just good for your knowledge in general. I think. Yeah. You know what pisses me off though? Yeah. Like the cafes in England don't open till like nine o'clock. Oh. Fucking Matt boggles my What do you mind. do before training? Uh, I, d no I don't, even, don't even know. <laughs> maybe you're not training till 10. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Well, maybe some would, but like, so when I went back home recently, stayed at my sister's. Yeah. Like 
near Liverpool. It's like, oh, let's go get a coffee. She's like, where are you going to get coffee from now? Not open. Sucks. And uh, it does. We're in yeah. France, they're like decaf. You know, like coffee, the caffeine's not as strong. Oh, really? So you could be pumping coffee about nine o'clock at night and go straight to bed. And when I've come back to Australia, I've got two coffees down me and I'm buzzing around the room. It's crazy. Even really? England, England's obviously it's similar not, to Australia. Mm. But France. Oh, no, the coffee in. in no? No. Oh, God, no. I, look, I'm very proud of England. I don't want to moan about it. The coffee's fucking. No good. No. It's, yeah, yeah. Not even on the, like, Australia cafe culture. Yeah, it's just good. It's good fucking food. prima. <laughs> like the best in the world. Um, Final question. Uh, the most interesting person you've met on this journey? Most interesting person I've met would be a guy called Alan Bell, who's uh, been a mentor for me. Um, he's a, an old coach. He coached through uh, Newtown and did a lot of stuff with Warren Ryan in the early days. Um, I've spoke about him a fair bit in the media when I was playing, but he did a lot of coaching with the Johns boys when they were coming through and they speak glowingly about Belly. He's become a really good friend, but just one of those older people that you talk to that just educate you on everything. Uh, he's taught me so much about footy. Um, we used to go for coffee at his house and we'd speak on the phone for hours, but Mrs. used to get jealous. But we'd just go for coffee at his house and yeah. just have books and books and books on halfback play and just the way he used to word things and, and say it was just so simple but um, intelligent and you could talk to him about anything. He'd talk about, like we was talking about coffee or whatever and he'd always have a, a story for everything. And he's been a good mentor to me, so hello, Billy. Yeah, good on you. Good yeah. on you, PC. I like that. It's not like someone, because you must have met a heap of... The one I wanted to meet was, I was in New York one year and Leonardo DiCaprio was in the barber shop. And it was in Soho, so it was quiet. I was going for dinner and there was no one around. I was going, I'm going to get a haircut. It was just the barber thing on. And I walked past. As I looked in, it was Leo, literally sitting there like you, face to me. And he looked at me, didn't know who I was. <laughs> and then, he, and then, he, and then, <laughs> then he looked straight back, straight like that. And I was just knock, I knocked on the door like a fanboy for about a minute. Just one photo, one photo. And the barber ended up saying, fuck off. And, oh. But I would have liked to meet him because I love Leo. Mm. <laughs> so, but I'll go with Belly. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> well, that's nice that you go with someone that there's that, that yeah. personal connection with. Well, mate, that uh, we'll wrap things up. But um, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your story. Um, think back to some of those battles we had against your Roosters oh, team. Your kick pressure. Play. I used to hate that. Yeah. Well, I had to go after Put me down. Push my head in the ground. Matt, come on. It was all fair. <laughs> it was all fair. But Matt, you were a, a magnificent competitor. That was something I always admired about you, that um, you were always chirping. Like if I was coming for you, kick pressure. Yeah. You're always chirping back and um, you always get a sense that you cared and you gave a fuck, which is two ingredients that I think is lost on players. Mm. You're passionate and you're a fucking good footballer. And I want to say... Um, it takes a lot of courage to keep coming back and keep getting up from getting knocked down. Uh, you played over 300 games in the NRL, went over and um, you know, topped that up in, in the Super League as well, but you you, you won a premiership. Um, you played for your state on multiple occasions. You won, you were part of a winning series there towards the back end as well. And I just want to say congratulations on a magnificent career. You should be very proud of it. And I'm excited to see where you go in the future as well, like just speaking to you here. Uh, I know we don't know each other that well, but it seems like you've got a real passion to to help people, which yeah. is which is an amazing quality to have. Thanks, Jimmy. Appreciate it, mate. Cheers, mate. Thanks very much.